Thank you for tuning in to another episode of InRange. This is, I believe, the fifth and final video in the 308 Extravaganza, where we tested a multitude of 308 battle rifles, both modern and old, in terms of trying to determine what's the best one available to you today. I'm here with Gary from MOD Outfitters and Survival Armor, and Matt from Primary and Secondary, and we have two of our shooters that participated in the rifle drills themselves, and I'd like them to introduce themselves to the camera and maybe give just a little blurb about why they're here and what they th why they wanted to participate in the drill. Uh, I'm Cole from Tactical Dalai Lama. I came mostly to hang out with Matt and meet everybody. I wanted to do the drill just for a chance to operate some modern rifles. Um, I've really never handled anything other than an AR-10 308 wise. Okay. And I'm Sandy Hughes, and I came not really totally expecting to shoot, um, but thought it might be good to have someone re relatively inexperienced in on the data set. And that's me. I've but, been shooting only for a couple of years. Yeah, but you are a shooter. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We can tell that. So it's, it's not like you haven't handled guns before. Yeah. yeah fair enough. Um, well, I, I, I shoot mostly um, ARs and AKs and pretty modern ones at that. So oh. uh, Gary has a lot of battle rifles and I have the opportunity to shoot them, but I've never shot any of the guns that were in this data set except for the FAL. And that's really good for this kind of data collection because that presents really a unbiased opinion, which is great. And so we're getting really two of those uh, on, on the field here today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the list of the, uh, the, the rifles from uh, last place to first place. And I'd like to hear a reaction of everyone here on the round table about what they think. Is that what they expected or what their thoughts are on that? Okay. So we have eight rifles at play today. And the, uh, the eighth place of our testing comes in is the HKG3. So now this is an aggregate score of cold start, transitions, splits, and the one to five mod drill. So what we did is we took where they placed in each one of those drills, added them together for a total score, and the lower number is the better rifle. So if they placed 10th on all four, they would have a score of 40, and that would be worst. If they placed first on all four, they would have a score of four, which would be the winner, right? So the G3 comes in last place with a score of 31. Um, let's go ahead and start with Sandy. What are your thoughts on the G3 in that regard, coming in last? Uh, not surprised at all. Um, I believe the comments I made in the immediate post-shooting period was ergonomic nightmare. <laughs> yeah, you did. You did say that. <laughs> um, I, once it was actually loaded, which and, and for me, charging it was a really difficult thing. Um, when, uh, shooting it was actually kind of awesome, and it was one of the ones that I felt pretty accurate with. Mm -hmm. um, so it was just getting to the point where I, I pulled the trigger was difficult for me. Um, so, uh, but I thought it was pretty accurate. Mm -hmm. It was pretty heavy. So I had a better impression of the heavier guns in the beginning of shooting, but by the time I was really fatigued, my favorites kind of changed around a little bit. So. <laughs> Your thoughts? Um, you can tell whoever designed it wasn't worried about you loading it real fast. <laughs> yep. uh, that was real obvious. I didn't. I thought the sights were hard to find. I mm -hmm. was not very accurate with it, in my opinion. Um, it's a cool gun, uh, but it's a real... I... I, I figured I, when we started, I made the prediction that it would come in last. Mm -hmm. um, I've, I've shot G3s enough and watched other people that were inexperienced shooting G3s enough to know that gun is exactly what she said. It's an ergonomic nightmare. Yeah. If you're trying to shoot drills with it that are dominated by the AR-15 for speed, you, can, you could expect that result pretty much every time. You can. Considering the nostalgic fervor some of my friends have for this rifle, mm. I, I am surprised at how low it went. Especially considering all the rifles that participated, mm. I was expecting it to go a bit higher than this. At not Definitely not last place. I'm going to double down on the term that it is a relic of an, a foregone time in which the designers didn't have speed or efficiency ever in mind. They were trying to do optimize production, cost, and reliability. That's what they were looking for. And you can also look at with the auxiliary gear that was issued with the gun. The pouches were not meant for speed. Nothing about the G3 says speed. No. Nothing. They came out of the Eastern Front. They designed rifles that were like, we need this thing to work in the worst of conditions, whether it's hot or cold, and we don't care about anything besides keeping it clean and running. And that's what the G3 does do, but it doesn't do any of it fast. Yeah. So, all right. So I said that was last place, but we actually have two guns tied for last place. And um, I actually would have guessed, my opinion, I would have guessed that these would have been the last place ones, and they turned out to be last, although I was not shooting in this drill. So my shooting in this has nothing to do with the results here. Um, also, a score of 31, although for different reasons, it's scored in different places on the four drills, is the Springfield M1A. Mm -hmm. Same score of 31. Let's start with you. Um, 
I just loathe that thing. I don't like the safety. I don't like the way the mags clip in. Front heavy is supposed to be good in a battle rifle, but it takes it to an extreme. And you really got to get your face crushed into it to even find the sights. Um, I think a modernized variant with a red dot where you can keep your head up a little bit, which is just the way we're used to shooting nowadays, would make a huge difference. But to me, it was a less ergonomic than the G3 for actually firing. Easier to load, but harder to actually hit stuff with. Mm. Um, this was the one I had in mind when I said in the beginning I liked different ones, because um, when we were doing our first round, um, it wasn't so, so difficult to hold it up. And I just, one of the rifles I happen to be familiar with is the M1 Garand, and it felt very familiar in that s sense to me, but by the time we were on the fourth drill, I couldn't even hold it up from the fatigue from trying to hold it, you know, hold mm. the gun, so. That forward um, weight again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, I was actually, I was expecting that to be the last. You were, yeah, I was. Even below the G3? Yeah, yes. Although they tied, yes. so maybe they, they're, they did yeah. Tie. They yeah. did tie, but um, with as much hate as so many people have with weight, with it not being modern, what everyone's used to, mm -hmm. everyone knows the AR, yep. this is fairly different from it. I'm not surprised by the result. I think that what you just said is very telling. And what he said was you really had to get a cheek weld, which is essentially what you mean when you say you have to right. cram your face down onto it instead of having your head up like with a modern red dot. That is, goes into what we had talked about in some of the earlier segments about our positioning in that people who are used to shooting heads up are going to have a hard time coming down, getting their cheek on the stock. Guys that shoot a lot of those old battle rifles or stocks where they're set up for irons, that's, I think that's very telling as to why you know, some of the other people had some issues with that gun. And possibly some of the other guns too, and it might be why the scar price is higher. And boy, the modern gymnastics that has been done to try to modernize the M14, M1A is um, an exercise in very strange futility, in my opinion. Yeah. You see those things that they put on these things to try to get red dots on them, or when they tried to make them a sniper rifle or a designated marksman rifle, I have a story from a guy I knew that, that was issued one in Vietnam as a designated marksman, and he said the scope would retain zero so poorly that he eventually took the scope off, threw it in his pack, and just used irons. He got sick yeah. of it. And I know you do. I know I do. Sandy does, too. I love M1 Garands. I do, too. That is, yeah, not, that is not an M1 Garand. Nope. They, they took a good design and made it worse mm -hmm. and forced it into a modernized role that it never belonged in. No. But I think that is why we see it at score 31. Agreed. But there was no bias in this testing. There really wasn't. It just where it landed up. All right. So I don't know if I'm going to call that this sixth place or seventh because the two bottom were tied for bottom. Let's go ahead and say sixth. Sixth place is the most modern gun on our list, the Desert Tech MDR, with a score of 28. It's also the only bullpup. And again, I think we do have to admit that no one here had a lot of bullpup experience. Bullpup experience. So there is an element there of training that might mitigate that score of 28. But there, I don't know that there's enough training that can mitigate everything that went to make this a 28. Would you like to start something with the Desert Tech? Um, I just didn't like it overall. It was... Uh, it wasn't that heavy, but it was a lot of recoil. For me, that's a big deal because mm -hmm. I'm small. So um, I just didn't like that, that at all. Okay. And it, plus the ergonomics of it, I was so unfamiliar. I mean, I could pretty much figure out the controls on most rifles, whether they're old or new. And that one, when, when I had a malfunction, I was like, uh, mm. <laughs> where do I go from here? So uh, I can imagine that malfunctioning in you know speed drills or some type of testing situation let alone an actual gunfight of some kind mm -hmm. and another thing to bring up on that front you've shot competition with it mm -hmm. how the hell do you unload and show clear with it uh what you pretty much need to do is open up take the side plate off run the action open and then you can visually identify the chamber so you have to take it apart you, well you have to take a part <laughs> off which is designed to be taken off easily However, I would be very concerned about that in a field condition in which you might even lose that part. Yep. But yeah, to do that, you cannot really show clear. You can take the mag out, open it up, and then you can look in the mag one. If you've got a light, you can see in there, but that's not something you can't really do in a competitive environment. Right. If you take the ejection port off and open it up, it will eject the round out the side, whether it's left or right, and then you can see in there. But if you, unless you take that off, you can't. Right. I really liked it for cold start. I thought the balance of it made it relatively fast to load and get the first round on target. Um, then the later drills were shooting it more. It's for a bullpup design and the way you would think it's balanced, it really has a lot of muzzle flip. 
Mm -hmm. um, you can just feel that giant bolt or whatever. The gas system, maybe the whole thing is moving, but it's just a crushing, slow rise, and then you have to fight it back down, even for a bullpup. I thought that was extreme. But yeah, for cold start, I liked where the magwell was. You really see it and jam it in there. It's nicely flared, too. It's easy to get a mag right. in there. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the initial rack is fine, but on some later drills, when I racked it, I did have, um, I did cause malfunction by not it all the way back. So. Yeah, you can induce malfunctions. When you, one of the things that is concerning about the system, especially in the 308, is that when you run the action back to, like, clear the gun or empty it, um, unless you do it with extreme force and you get it all the way to the rear. It feels like you're all the way to the rear, but you're not quite there. You have to go a little further, and that's what jams the uh, fully loaded cartridge into the spring clip of the ejection port. And if you only go part of the way, one of two things can happen. One, when you let it go, it just closes and puts the round back in the chamber, which is a problem because you haven't cleared the gun. Or if you get it just at the right spot, you know what happens? It jams, and then you got to take it apart a little bit. Right. So that's not great. Uh, any thoughts? With us living in the U.S., ARs are, that's America's rifle. It is. Bull pups, that right there is going to be problematic for the average shooter. Mm -hmm. Add the fact that no one got to really practice or get to know the weapon at all. Another factor is with the controls. So with all of these events combined, it's not a really surprising word placed. With that in mind, I was anticipating this to go lower than the G3. Okay. Any thoughts, more Gary, on, on the uh, Desert Tech? The, the only thing I would have to say about it is we, we experienced malfunctions with virtually every rifle, I think, with the exception of the FAL. Mm -hmm. And without exception, every other malfunction, the user was able to clear it except this rifle. You had to clear every single malfunction I on did. that rifle. Yeah. yeah. Um, and that, the clearing malfunctions are not intuitive, and it seemed pretty, pretty catastrophic. You know when it happened everything stopped it does and so that kind of for me personally in terms of i mean let's face it what they're called battle rifles they're fighting rifles mm -hmm. that immediately eliminates that from consideration just the fact that it's so problematic when you do have that inevitable malfunction no matter how good the gun is something will it, go wrong it is someday. inevitable mm -hmm. you're going to have a malfunction it's it just took that completely out of any kind of consideration for me Fair. So this gun probably would be far more training intensive for proficiency compared to going AR to SCAR to... Oh, it would be because it is a yeah. complete change of, 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 of manual of arms. Yeah. I think it's possible, but I think some of the things that you just can't... You, there are things you can't mitigate, such as the ability to clear a malfunction because you can't see what's gone awry. Yep. You have to literally take parts off to see into the gun. Right. And if the bolt's in the wrong state, you can't get the part off. Yeah. Which is, we weren't dealing with completely inexperienced gun people. So like no, I said, they were able to no. clear every other malfunction yeah, yeah. on their own, yeah. except that one. Uh, it's a concern I've had with the gun since I've started using it, which is being able to see into the action. All right, so fifth overall is the FNFAL with a total score of 23. Oh, so it's kind of pretty much the foul came in middle of, middle, middle of the pack. Yeah, yeah, middle of the pack, which is really good for a very old gun. Yeah. Heavy. Sandy, any thoughts? Uh, I was actually the most familiar. This, this is the only one I've ever shot in this yep. whole lineup. Um, so it was a little bit familiar to me. And I felt like a lot of the other guns were heavier than that one. So I think I did pretty well with that one. Okay. Tactical Dalai Lama? Uh, I, liked, I liked it a lot. Mm -hmm. um, it seemed like if you just change the charging handle situation, and it's, it's, ready, it's ready to rock. I mean, honestly, it's a... It's a pretty cool Did gun. Did you feel like the mag changes were easy? Mag changes, I don't like rock and lock anything. I, I will always struggle with it because I just I have to stop and think about what I'm doing. Mm. But it was easier, and I did have a malfunction with it. I was able to. Oh, did you have one? I was able to fix it. Oh, you did have one. I didn't think we had any. Yeah, I, I think it was did. before I was on the clock. Oh, was, okay, that's why. Goofing but off. yeah, yeah, but it was easy. I, you, you could deal with it. So I I thought it was awesome. I'd like to see somebody make one that's fully updated. I think it'd be really cool. Thoughts, Matt? Um, okay, well, basically the, the FAL, the foul, whatever we're calling it, this is this was the inspiration of this entire series. For it was, me. yeah. Um, basically, a few, a few months ago, I had the opportunity to pick one up. I mm. always wanted one. I got it. I had it in hand, and I was impressed with it. Mm. I shot it and realized, you know, for as old as this is, what is it, 50s? A oh, yeah. 1950s design, compared to other similar things, G3s, M1As, this is fairly modern. Yeah. So I wanted to see, okay, how does this compare to modern, and how does this compare to old? 
and here we have our results. I find it to be a very cool gun. I find it to be very modern for what it is for the era it's coming out of. But we have some other results that are... Yeah, do you want it in 2019, though? Okay, so if, if I'm in a police department, I have a limited budget. If I have... If I'm in an environment like this where I might be the only law enforcement on duty mm. uh, for, for half an hour, uh, wide areas that I might need to cover, mm -hmm. I might want a, a, a little less expensive semi-automatic 308. Put some modernization on it. I could see. I could see. I would like. I would like to have that as I'm, an option. I'm smirking because as we go through the rest of the results, I think there might be better choices. Exactly. For what you're saying. Exactly. Any thoughts? I'm a. I'm a pretty well known FAL guy. I love FALs. Um, I like. I like everything about FALs. I like the history. I like the design elements. I like all those things. But the FAL, or in fact, the vast majority of these battle rifles, they were obsolete when they were designed. They were. The concept was obsolete hmm? when it was designed. The cartridge, as far as fighting rifles go, was obsolete when it was designed. The, the you know, battle rifle, I mean, at the time, people called that intermediate. Yeah. Um, you know, which now we think of it as a full-size, full-power cartridge. Um, there is not, you know, for me, the FAL will always be something special for me just because of the history of it but there's no there are no circumstances where I would pick it as a fighting rifle over an AR15 or an AK either one fourth overall with a score of 22 only one point better than the foul but beating the foul scar 17 which is interesting because that's a gun that's been, I mean, in recent history, adopted recently. I mean, by yep. modern standards. Lots of money into it. Yeah, lots of money into that. Um, it's like a uh, pumpkin spice latte. I mean, it's... So hmm. autumn only? I mean, it's it's something that's just basic. Like, it, it runs and it shoots. It's not the balance. There's nothing great about it, but there's nothing terrible about it. It just does what it does. And um, I've shot the smaller one before. And I like the 5.56 version a lot better. Scar Light. Yeah. Scar 16. What do you think? This one was my least favorite. I told wow. Gary that I would actually take the Gold Pup. <laughs> Except <laughs> okay. for the fact that it. No, that's good to hear. It. No, that's interesting. Um, I shot the Gold Pup better. Uh -huh. um, the Scar was huge recoil. I, For me, I felt like it was the worst one out of everything that we shot. Okay. Um, so just that was, that was the main reason. The, the controls were familiar uh -huh. to me. Um, so I, I didn't have problems reloading it or operating it at all, but just shooting it, I, I know I was like pulling it and anticipating sh the shot, and it was just really heavy for me. Fair. Gary? Um, that rifle, I think, is extremely lightweight for what it is. Um, probably too light. Is there a point where things yeah, are too I, light? I, I think it's probably too light mm -hmm. for 7.62 NATO. Um, as we said in earlier segments, I'm not a fan of the stock configuration yeah. in the slightest. Um, I think it would have performed better, and I think she would have liked it better with an optic. I agree. I think that's the one big issue. We kind of almost tied one leg, you know, with it, one, hand, one, arm, one hand behind its back, so to speak, yeah. in running it with iron sights. But I don't feel like that rifle is really optimized or set up to run... Iron sights. Iron sights are an afterthought. They're truly a backup. Yeah, they're they're an afterthought on that rifle, and I think we kind of hamstrung it a little by not running it with an optic, but we had to have some kind of control there. It's true. Um, they work. They function. Um, I tend to view a lot of things through the lens of what kind of suppressor host is this, <laughs> and, the, and the scar is sort of a notoriously bad silencer host. From the 17 to the 16, you know, it does it doesn't matter. So. It's not one of my favorite rifles in the lineup. I think it's interesting it placed so closely to the FAL, a rifle which by the same design firm, manufacturer... You they're know, both FN, yeah, very they're, good point. They're both yeah. FN, and a rifle that was supposed to be the next generation placed immediately next to that. And it didn't even occur to me. That fared almost no better. That's really interesting. Any so, thoughts on the scar? Oh, I'm uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I'm, I was done. Yeah, so basically we're getting closer to what everyone's used to ergonomically and with controls. Yeah, we are. But it's supposedly a more refined version. This is this is the modern iteration of the stoner design or of that. Well, of that it's not sure it's design, but gas the, piston. Yeah, the, the, yeah. the whole the, the controls. The ergonomics. Yeah. yeah. And so where it placed, it's not overly surprising. 
third place, getting to the top here. Sons of Liberty Gunworks Mark 10 with a score aggregate of 17. So the scar was 22, and the Mark 10 comes in at 17. This is just a big old AR on steroids. Let's start with Sandy on this one. Uh, I love. I was. I see. I felt familiar with it because I have a Sons of Liberty mm -hmm. on five five six. So I felt like it was going to be the same gun, but a lot more recoil, and it's a pretty heavy. Like there, it's just heavy duty. Um, but I know that their guns are not meant to be. They're they're meant to be durable. Yeah. And they, we run anything in ours. I mean, we only shot. I shot that gun a little bit that day. But I know when we run ours, we could put any ammo in it. It doesn't malfunction, and that's kind of what they make their guns to do. So it do, it does what it was supposed to it, do. It was reliable. Um, but I, I don't like the it in that caliber. It's pretty heavy for me. I really liked um, how familiar I was with the whole platform. Um, some people said the recoil with it was more extreme than the Brownells AR-10. I thought the recoil was more manageable than the Brownells. Okay. Um, I think it's because I'm really familiar with that style of stock. Like I dig it in and twist, and it's not moving. Um, it's just a modern rifle that's made to work. Um, it's not necessarily a race gun. I think Mike would probably be really comfortable with saying it's not a race gun. So. Okay. It's. I mean, it's a. It's a fighting rifle. It's an AR-10 platform. Everybody's familiar with it. Um, I. I frankly thought that would get the number one slot. Same. So did I. Um, that's. That's what I thought. Having shot it. It did seem a little more recoily than to me. I was exactly the opposite. I felt like the Brownells rifle had less recoil, um, even though it also felt lighter. You know, <laughs> uh, but I mean, it's a great rifle, and I know those to be quality products. And I'm not surprised it placed high. I'm kind of surprised it didn't place number one. Um, but again, we were shooting iron sights on an optics platform with we were. you know a flat top. Yeah. So. So with all the shooters being super familiar with ARs, I find that the placement of this, it, it makes sense that it's at the top, near the top. Anything higher than this, there's some form of improvement. There's, these are obviously doing every, something better because I would find this, this would be the baseline of performance because this is what everyone knows. Well, it's funny you say that because second place. Yeah. We're getting to the first, but second place. I gotta admit, this makes me giggle. Yeah. It's the Brownells BRN10, yeah. 1957 pattern Cuban retro rifle, with a score of 14. Excuse me, 15. The uh, the M Mark 10 was 17, so it beat it by two points. But I mean, a gun that Brownells kind of made for funsies, really. Yep. Shows the elegance of the Stoner design, and that it came in second out of our eight guns in 308. Let's start with the Dalai Lama on this one. Um. The rifle handles great, it shoots great. Towards the end of the day, we saw some real problems with the magazines. We did. Um, I think that in a more endurance-oriented environment, we would have we would have had to kick it completely out after a while because the magazines were horrible. Mm -hmm. um, I know Brownells is completely trying to do the retro thing, but if they would give you the option to, to take one just like it that takes P-Mags, it would be the most fun, just beat around the farm, 308 rifle ever. Um, I, it's well balanced. It shoots fast. It comes back to target. The three prong, I think it's a three prong, wasn't it? Yeah. It was a flash hider. Yeah, three, yeah the, flash the three prong flash hider. I mean, it, it's it was controllable. Uh, I liked it. I liked the length of it. Um, Stoner definitely knew what he was doing in regards to the the ratio of length, the stock length, the trigger pull. Um, he was on it. I really didn't like yanking from the top. That that little. It, first of all, it feels like you're about to pull the trigger because you're using your yeah. And it gets hot. It does. Um, so, and when you have to mortar it, it feels really strange. Um, the reason they got away from that charging handle uh, was because of heat, because it's right over the gas key, excuse right. me, gas tube and gas key. And as a result, all the heat transfers into that. It turned out that by getting away from it, they not only got away from a heat issue, they actually made a better gun that was more ergonomic. Right. But I agree. Better gas seal, too. Now, better, a better sealed system for dirt and debris, too. Sandy? I liked shooting this gun. It wasn't a ton of recoil. It, um, the controls were familiar. And my only complaint in this whole thing ha with it being speed drills was that top charging handle. It's not only that it's awkward, it's hard to pull back, but it's also enclosed in the carry handle as well. So trying to dig around and find that when you're trying to change mags and, I mean, and you change a mag and then you um, re 
charge it. It's just that slowed me down a lot. So that was really the only complaint, though. It was like the perfect weight. It was a nice balance between heavy enough to not recoil a lot and light enough that you could shoot it a lot all day and not have an issue. Yep. So I liked it. Gary? I, I liked everything about that rifle. I think it's one of the coolest guns I've seen out come out in a long time. I've been in the gun business for about 27 years in some form or another, and it's a very rare shot show where I walk out and say I was actually excited about something. <laughs> I know, yeah, that's um, true. And this year I walked out excited about that and another Brownells product, the BR-180, I think they call it. Yeah, BR-180. Yeah, so I think that that rifle, is a, as you mentioned earlier, it's a testament to Stoner and Sullivan and having to Armalite in general back then. It is. It, it survives to this very day as functionally very little has changed. And there's a reason. Yeah. Um, and it's stood the test of time. And that was probably, well, it's interesting it came in second because it was the rifle, I would say, was the second most enjoyable one to shoot out of all of them. So I'm not, I'm surprised, hmm? but pleasantly surprised. <laughs> it's fun. Matt? Yeah. Uh, very pleasantly balanced. Hmm? That top, uh, that top uh, charging, charging handle, handle yeah. was miserable. It is. Absolutely miserable. But... Also, had we changed the parameters of this, I suspect this would have gone closer to the bottom of the stack if this was red dot oriented. I think this whole thing would have well, been completely changed. I think that would be an interesting follow-up. However, I don't think this would be able we'd be able to add that. It's a capability that gun does not have. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, but this is definitely that this is an iron sighted rifle. So well and this was an iron sight test. Yeah. And yeah. so that's yeah. another reason why it kind of placed as well as it well. did. Yeah. I have a couple things to say about this gun. One, the fact that it became, the, I, in general, the consensus, and we're hearing that here, but other shooters, these are not all the shooters we had on the drill. We had a number of people. Really, the general consensus, I, I don't think I heard anyone that didn't say anything, but wow, I like this thing. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the I do too, and in fact, when, if you haven't seen the two-gun competition where I shot this along with Ian, um, I came in third out of, I think, 70 shooters with that gun, and most of those people were using Red Dot ARs. So that gun performs. Um, it performs because Brian did a good job, and this is not sponsored by Brian by the way. This happens to be just where this landed up. But the gun is great. They've done a good job of reproducing Stoner's design with somewhat more modern components so that it's more resilient and durable. The only thing I will say, and I will agree with you, if you want the cool retro look, go ahead and pick up the Brian waffle mags. Do not expect to use them for any length of time. They are designed really close to the originals, and those were considered to be really uh, consumable, consumable yeah. items. You're supposed to get the ammunition issued to you in that mag, and the feed loops on them bend, and then the gun doesn't work. So if you're going to get yourself a Brownells BRN10, get yourself some decent SR25 mags. DPMS makes aluminum ones. You buy five of them, one of them won't work. <laughs> but the four will. Test them out. Once you got the ones that work, they're good. If you can find the DPMS steel mags, those really work. And if you want to splurge a little, spend a bit of money and buy the ones from, uh, from Knights. He sells them too. And those are definitely going to work. But get the Brownells waffle mags, and I'm sorry, Brownells, but it's the truth. Get them only for looks. Don't get them for shooting. And other than that, if you get good mags and put it in the BRN10, the BRN10 freaking rocks. All right. The winner of 308. And I, I, I'm, a, I'm a little surprised, but not entirely after yeah. I started handling it. Robinson Arms XCRM with a score of 14. And this is what makes me just kind of go. What about those trials? Scratch my head here. That was supposed to be in the SCAR trials. And because of bureaucratic stupidity, um, he didn't send enough, uh, I think it was blank adapters. Yeah. It was excluded from the trial entirely because of that mistake. Now, would it have passed or would it have surpassed the SCAR, that the currently adopted FN SCAR 17? I don't know. But in our trials, it outperformed it in almost every way. It handles better, in our tests at least. And the fact that it didn't get a chance against the FN SCAR because of that little glitch is sad because we might have fielded a different gun. Um, let's start with Sandy. What did you think of the Robinson Arms? I loved it. It was my favorite. I shot it. I think you just you guys put it in my hand. I'd never touched it before, and it, it just worked. I knew where everything was on it. It was intuitive. It was the perfect weight. I, would, I couldn't even believe I was shooting um, such heavy ammo in it because it just felt great. So it was my favorite. I liked the sights on it, everything about it. Cool. And I was just, I've never heard of this gun before in my life. <laughs> so, so you, like, you really, what is you had it? nothing, you had no bias going <laughs> into that one at all. Um, I think it's super vanilla, but it's really good vanilla. Mm -hmm. High quality vanilla. French vanilla. 
Yeah, maybe French vanilla. <laughs> you know, real vanilla is expensive. Vanilla is expensive. You see chunks of the vanilla beans in the ice cream. Yeah, I mean it's uh, it's vanilla, vanilla, but sometimes vanilla works great. And uh, I looked at it when I first saw it on the table. I was like, "What kind of gas system is this? It's silly." But in spite of its weird gas system, it's very well balanced, and the recoil was very manageable. Um, it has a good comp on it. Um, a, I would I would put it in my safe tonight. If I had the opportunity. Yep. Matt. Surprising. Yeah. Absolutely surprising. I've uh, let's see here. I was I am familiar with Robinson. I've used Rob. I even used a Robinson AK, a Vepper, yep. as a patrol rifle for a couple of years. Uh, great AK. This was a great rifle. It's impressive. Uh, it's unfortunate that it doesn't have the publicity or the following or whatever that it could have. It would have if it had been in those trials. Yeah, yeah, but very impressive, cool gun. Yeah. I'd like. I'd be really anxious. I'd be excited to see this in another trial where we use optics. I agree. Yeah. I think Excuse me, Gary. Yeah, I, uh, I, th I always think the best testament I can give to something is to say that I will buy one, and I will. Cool. I will buy one of those. And I, I've played with the XCR before in five five six, and I kind of thought it was ho hum. You know, yeah. it didn't really sort of blow my skirt up at all. This did. Yeah. Um, there's sort of a sweet spot there, or something with seven six two NATO, and that rifle. I liked. The recoil impulse was mild. It had a break. It had a very effective break. It does. I don't think, because of the weight of the rifle, that a lesser effective break is going to make that a world of difference in terms of shooting enjoyment. Um, it's crazy that it's like a long stroke piston gun in a short stroke world. You know yeah. I mean? <laughs> I, when I got it and I saw that, I'm like, what? And then you shoot it and you're like, okay. And there's yeah. really, I mean, what does it share in common with the AR-15 pistol grip? Yeah, I mean, I think that's pretty much it, right? It has a different trigger. It really is. It its has own a thing. different bolt. It's it's just it's something totally different, which the, is somewhat refreshing. The stock to, trigger is good too. To a guy that's interested in that and design aspects and you know things of that nature, but just for sheer shooting enjoyment, it shocked the hell out of me. I I was really surprised, even after the very first stage. I think you and I talked, and I said, "Wow, I am really impressed with that." That was Robinson, hype. and that only continued. It only continued. I I am going to buy one. It's a really cool rifle. That was my thought when I started shooting it too. And it's interesting to note that the stock on the Robinson Arms XCRM is just as modular as the Scar 17, mm. but not as annoying. I found can, it far more comfortable. You can adjust. You can adjust like the pull. It's foldable and comb height, just like on a Scar 17. So what boot does that look like? It doesn't. Uh, it looks a little uggish actually. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's amazing. That the winner. Overall, of our testing over, man, we put a lot of rounds down range, a lot of shooters, and a lot of time out here in, in the hot sun. The, the winner, and congratulations to Robinson Arms for coming through um, on our test. And these, these data sets will be posted online for you guys to sort through in a sortable way, so I'll put those links in the description below. Um, one thing I do want to mention is none of this testing came into field conditions, durability over, you know, 28,000 rounds, how it deals with certain types of fouling or anything. We didn't get into that. This is strictly ergonomics and shootability. That's all we tested. So if one of these guns that's at the top of the list happens to break after 10,000 rounds, that's not in this data set, yep. right? But what we did test is how these guns shoot and handle amongst a myriad of different shooters in aggregate. Right. And so that's a real interesting result. I'm going to give the controls here real quick. We did include an AR-15 and 5.56 and an AK-74 and 5.45 just to show the difference between intermediate cartridges and 308. The winner, not surprising, is the AR-15 with a score of 8, and the AK-74 came in with a score of 12, and that puts it two points below the Robinson Arms XCRM, which is really quite minimal difference when you yeah. really think about it. And I think what that comes down to there is strictly ergonomic issues and training. Yep. So, uh, really fascinating. Um, Matt, we had some sponsors for this. Yes, we did. Uh, first off, going to basically give big thanks to uh, JW Ramp as our videographer. He yes. was awesome through this. Uh, not only did he help with videography, photography, but he also helped with some of the number crunching for all of our projects. He did a lot of the Excel work. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. so without his help, we couldn't have been able to do this. So make sure you check him out on Instagram and let's see here. I don't know if he has YouTube, but uh, Facebook. Uh, great guy, does a great job with mm -hmm. what he does. Um, also, a big thank you to Short Round Supply. They... <laughs> They basically, they didn't supply all the ammo, but they provided some excellent pricing, along with, we did, we did get a little additional ammo in there. Uh, make sure you give them a follow. They actually have a very good selection of ammo. Um, 
we basically discussed what our needs were. We discussed what the what the specific rounds were that we needed for all these tests, mm. and BJ sent it right away, and uh, it was very That's painless. Big thank you to Overwatch Precisions. Precision, you might know them for their Glock triggers. Great guys. Uh, AJ's a friend. He was actually going to come out and help us with this. He was going to be one of our shooters. Unfortunately, things got in the way, couldn't come out, but uh, Overwatch Precision helped fun part of this as well. So big thanks to our sponsors on that. Uh, this, I don't think this whole thing could have gone better. No, I, I agree. Uh, I do want to say, though, that even though we had sponsorship and support in that regards, uh, if you look at the all whole slew of videos that came out of this collaborative weekend between Gary and Matt and myself and everyone here, Gary, you, you, we did an armor test where you yep. supplied a whole bunch of armor for us from Survival Armor to put rounds on. That's expensive, too. But the reality is both primary and secondary and in-range could not have done any of this if it wasn't for Patreon. Yeah. Because even though there were discounts for people supplying armor to shoot at, Getting here, days to do this, cost to be here, you bought a lot of ammo above and beyond, even if it was discounted, to get this done, um, is because of viewer support, because we're not monetized by anything but viewers. Yep. So I would urge you, if you like this type of intelligent, intellectual firearms-related content, to consider supporting primary and secondary, or in range or both, depending on what your preference is, or another creator that does similar work that's worth supporting uh, with your Patreon dollars. If you already are a supporter, you may this happen. If you're considering it, please do. If you can't, I understand. Just subscribe to both our channels and you can find us at all points of different distribution networks. You can find you on Facebook, YouTube, etc. Yep. And you can find all of the in-range distribution networks on inrange.tv. Thanks for watching. <laughs>